Today we're here with artist Francis Ferdinands from Northumberland County, uh, a neighbor, but not so close, about half an hour away. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we are here uh, doing the next episode of A View from the Easel for the Art Gallery of Northumberland. Uh, and we are outside. It may rain at any moment, but that'll be so much more interesting if it does. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Teddy, for joining us. Um, Francis, let's start in the present. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your current work and then maybe go back from there. What are you working on these days? Well, uh, my current work is really a continuation of a series I began about two, two and a half years ago called um, Cultural Intersections in which I use um, traditional patterns that are based in South Asia, um, the Islamic world, and the Western world, and merge these. So it's really combining different visual languages and talking about the intersections of these languages, the migrations of these languages, and um, maybe collisions of these languages. And so I use them um, not in a traditional way, but incorporate them with um, whatever kind of um, sometimes message I'm trying to say. So for example, um, an Islamic pattern may then be translated into a vessel um, and uh, speak about that in terms of what the vessel may be. It could be a hand grenade, which is what that vessel is, um, combined you know, with an Islamic pattern. I also used um, representations of uh, botanical um, imagery, animals, birds, flora and fauna, mostly um, from, from the tropics because that's where I'm from and I guess that's my background being a South Asian so I lean towards that. Um, so yes, they're decorative, um, but also, I would say, political at the same time. And uh, that's all done with a certain amount of intentionality. Um, the decorative uh, normally, in, in history, has been kind of relegated to the background. It's not, it hasn't been considered fine art, but, but you see it very differently. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think uh, for me, a great, um, release and boost came out of discovering the pattern and decoration movement. It's a Western movement that originated, um, I think, in the US. Um, and this comes out of the late 70s. And it was a movement that said, um, there's nothing wrong with decoration. It's being denigrated. Um, it's actually, if you look at um, world culture, world history, decoration forms the underpinnings of most non-Western cultures. So um, this is a very Western point of view that everyone seems to have adopted with minimalism and these other movements that really overshadowed the pattern and decoration movement. And I think since the knots since the early 2000s, there's been a resurgence of this with brought in by obviously a younger generation of artists mm -hmm. that don't have the same hangups that um, people of that era had. Right. Um, because, I mean, I came through that era in terms of schooling, so we're talking about uh, the 70s, the 80s, and minimalism, conceptualism, all of these things were uh, hard edge painting. All of these things were dictated as the norm and they were dictated by white men. And the pattern and decoration movement also um, allowed women to shine for the first time because then they could bring in their own culture of textiles and this feminine culture as well into the work. I'm, it's really fascinating that how you contextualize your work within history, um, but also um, it, your, your work is not just 
self-expression, but it really connects with people and, and, and events in history, yeah. current and, and past. Yeah. Uh, you, you dropped a bomb with the, the hand grenade earlier, <laughs> and then I'm thinking, well, we need to talk about that. Uh, you know, why hand, gr hand grenade in that, that piece that you worked on? Well, in that particular piece, I think it's um, in Silk Roads, um, which alludes to the ancient Silk Roads, and um, there are vessels within that painting, and one of them is a hand grenade. And um, the Silk Roads were about um, war, they were about takeover, they were about um, colonization. And so the hand grenade war fits into all of these concepts, mm -hmm. you know. Um, are, you, are you familiar with the, the rugs from, and this might not be just rugs, but for, um, I have one in my collection actually, uh, a war rug from Afghanistan. Uh, and, and there are depictions of, of well, the minarets look like rockets and, and they're helicopters and yes. are you familiar I've with that body of work? Yes, yeah. I've seen that yeah. body of work. I'll have to show yeah. you later. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, also, what you got me thinking about decoration pattern pre-Renaissance. I mean, there was a moment in our, our history where artist, the word artist became important or the, the concept of the artist, whereas before we, they, we were all crafts people, if you will. Yes. And even if, if you think about when we talk about Western art, I wonder if, if, if artists in antiquity or even Egyptian, uh, uh, ancient Egypt were considered artists or maybe they were decorators as well. So, you know, when you look at a frieze on a, on a temple, mm -hmm. you, you know, yes, we think of it as being classical art today, but I wonder if it was perceived so much as you know, the expression of one artist or, or the expression of a culture, the pattern of the culture. And, and this, you're getting me to think a little bit about how we've warped through modernism. We've warped the, you know, we've, we've turned art into something that it ne wasn't necessarily the same historically. And this return that started in the 70s, by women, I, I, I would think mostly. Are there, I'm curious no, if there are no, any men. No, there were men. Robert Kushner was um, a big proponent of the pattern and decoration movement. No, there were men as well, but um, primarily women, and some of them are very, very famous yes. now. You know. um, so, uh, sorry, I lost my train. That's right. right. I thought I was, um, yeah, I was going to say something else about it. I think, um, I think with the arts and crafts movement in, in Britain. 19th century. 19th century, mm -hmm. William Morris and all of that sort of thing, brought back that culture again. Um, and I think uh, raised, you know, decoration to a new level. And... Um, I think that was part of the guild system as well. Yeah. And it, I guess the, the other thing that really um, I want to point out with the work is that there's such an emphasis on handmade. Um, and because uh, it's so detailed, uh, there's a lot of time spent doing this. So there's it brings in the concept of the handmade and labor. This is labor intensive. This is not, uh, you know, a Jeff Koons balloon dog that, you know, some assistant can just put in a mold and create. This takes um, enormous amounts of time and an enormous amounts of research as well because your starting point is tradition, right? So you have to say, okay, what was this pattern traditionally used as? Was it on a walking stick? Was it on a silver serving tray? Uh, where was this used? What was it used mm -hmm. for? And then you go from there to, what do I want to use it for? You know, and put my own interpretation, my own content right. into the work. Um, do you, th that transformation process, 
which I guess is the creative process, right? You're taking yeah. one thing and augmenting it, bring it into, I mean, you're moving it from one context to another right. as well. Uh, it, there's a didactic quality to presenting this work, uh, an educational right. component, component as well. Uh, what's also really strikes me interesting in your career, which is now four decades? Almost, next almost year. Three, next year, next congratulations. Year. <laughs> is that's not where you started. You started uh, studying at York University, if, yeah. and of course before that as a youngster, I'm sure, just intuitively. Um, but, but during your studies at York, uh, conceptualism was really the, the art of, of the time. Yeah. Uh, it still uh, plays a role today, obviously. Um, uh, when you were in school studying conceptualism, did you see a future that involved pattern at all? Or did, it, did that come later in life? That, um, I grew up with pattern. Um, our house that I grew up in was full of Sri Lankan batiks and um, artifacts, objects from Sri Lanka. So I lived with pattern. And um, I think I, after university or through university, I was really caught up in what was going on at that time. And um, when my mother died, I inherited this book. Um, it was a Sri Lankan book, all in Sinhalese, which I don't speak or understand anymore but it was full of traditional patterns. And so I inherited this book. I always knew that it existed, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. And then when I got a grant to go back to Sri Lanka in 2015 to be mentored in um, traditional mural painting and bobbin lace making, I took this book with me. And um, lo and behold, the teacher that I had for mural painting pulled out the same book, and she said, we're going to start working from this book. Wow. So at that point, I felt I had come full circle, you know, that I had come home. Well, that's, that's really beautiful. Um, it, had you been back to Sri Lanka between, before that at all? Yes, I'd gone back, you know, as a holiday kind right. of experience to, um, you know, have a holiday with my relatives. Uh, but. Then I went back, I think it was just before the tsunami. I, um, my mother took me back the very first time when I was 15 years old. She said, you got to go back to you know, reconnect with your culture. And so I took my son back then, and he was 15 years mm -hmm. old. I said, you have to go back. So we did a major trip then. And after that, I said, you know, I have to go back more often. And so this grant, certainly helped me because I spent three months there. And then I got another grant to go back to study mass making in 2017, and I spent two months there. So it's, uh, I've learned a lot, wow. you know, through those experiences. Well, mass making is um, functional art as well, yes. because it usually, if I'm not mistaken, part of ceremonial yeah. Uh, yeah. ritual yeah. Uh, activity yeah. that's community-based. Yes. Um, when, when you bring it out of that context and bring it to the Canadian context, uh, because I assume you also identify as a Canadian artist. Yes. Of course. Um, I'm really most interested in how you see the transform, transformative uh, moment. It, 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 is it a moment or is it, you know, does it uh, gain new meaning? Does it lose, shed something? Um, is it something that um, is for you or for other people? Um, you know, th I, I can relate to this, this question as well because m my background is Greek and right. there is a struggle often or a disconnect between, you know, trying to bring anything from, I mean, of course, also the Western tradition of, of Greek Right. Art is problematic, I suppose, when we think about colonialism and, and, mm -hmm. and Western traditions, et cetera, in Canadian context today. So 
generally speaking, it's avoided. I avoid it. Um, we, uh, because, and I'm still working on how to figure that out. But for you, you you're very immersed and flow very freely between the our Canadian uh, your your identity as a Canadian artist and your identity uh, historically, you know, because you were born in Sri Lanka and you came in 1958, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, as immigrant children, I, I imagine there is a certain amount of rebellion initially, a certain amount of wanting to be like your yes. friends. Yes, um, of course. But now course. that we're older, obviously mm -hmm. we we cherish the past a lot more. Um, is it is it a celebration for you to bring these elements into the Canadian context? Is it um, uh, is it a journey, or are these artifacts that you create are they uh, are you know are they end pieces where you know they're they're fait accompli, or is it you know you do you do a piece that will then bring you to the next piece, and so the journey continues. Yeah, I don't. You work in I, series as well. I work in series. Yeah. I don't. I haven't left this series, so it still um, continues to interest me. Um, I I find uh, the way that I work now, and I have chosen to do this, um, is to work more intuitively. So in my earlier earlier work, um, it would be heavily conceptually based. So I have it. Have an idea of what I was trying to, to say, whether it was a social commentary, political commentary, um, whatever, and then the work would come out of that. It would be an expression of that. Whereas now, I'm not really thinking about uh, content so much, but content always emerges mm -hmm. as I work through the work. So I find it kind of curious, a very interesting, um, just as the process is evolving. So basically, I will start with no real idea of what the painting is going to be about. And I'll start with just drawing shapes, painting shapes, or start with one idea of, uh, for example, in my most recent work, I wanted to paint a vegetable. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, but I had this picture beautiful picture of a bok choy. So I started with the bok choy. And then that led to suggesting something else, which leads to suggesting something else. And so for me, it's kind of exciting because I never know where the painting is going until it's finished. Right. And, you know, mind you, with this approach, I get stuck and I have to stop because I don't know mm -hmm. what's coming up next. And it's only when it gets revealed to me that well, I can, can move continue. on. Well, to, it sounds to me like you're operating in several different artistic mindsets at the same time. Yeah. You know, you're, you, th this intuitive process obviously is, is you know, not what you studied at right. New York University. Right. Uh, yes. and, and yet you're you realize or you know deep within you that there's value in it. Yes. Um, but at the same time, you do rely on other faculties. Like you, you're, uh, the yes. bok choy piece, which we were looking at uh, in your studio last week, um, there are many elements in it uh, that then started the tension between these different elements, elements yes. bring new meaning or you discover relationships yes. in the process of yeah. this very detailed kind of yes. painting. And, and, you know, it was revealed to me through the painting that, yes, this painting could probably only have been created through COVID-19. Why is that? Well, because the elements that started to appear really harked back to other, you know, global situations that we've had, like, Hoof and mouth disease, you know, um, um, the plague, you know. So, you know, these were not intentional, but they just kind of right. Right. arrived there. It's like you have a library in your head of, and it's obviously worldly experience, but in history because we're older. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, you probably couldn't have painted this piece when you were 24. No, no. Right. 
No. No. Yeah. There is a technical side to it. You know, one does not learn to paint the way you paint. Um, Incidentally, overnight. I'm, a, I'm a self-taught painter, even though I studied painting at university. Um, at that particular time, uh, the modus operandi was do not teach, just do. Mm -hmm. So everything was through osmosis. And uh, when you look at my work, it's especially the earlier work, is highly representational. So that skill I had to pick up on my own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my theory is that um, we all learn on our own. Even um, my experience in, in, in studying architecture, now teaching architecture, um, I often tell the students, you, you are uh, teaching yourselves here. Mm -hmm. I'm just a, a guide, yeah. a rough guide. Uh, and and the, the technique of painting or making music um, is something that um, is t heavily influenced by time. In other words, you have to do it for a long period of time. Of course, your teacher is not there all the time, right? So yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the journey, these, all these journeys are, are quite individual and, and we all have predispositions maybe. You know, yeah. you're predisposed to paint Yes. Beautifully. I mean, yes. you have the skill, the dexterity. Yes. Um, if you hadn't that, you probably would have done something else. Yes. Well, I, you know, I, I really um, think that my training as a classical pianist contributed a lot to my career as a painter because, A, um, it's technically very difficult to play classical piano, and, B, it takes enormous hours of practice, practice, practice. So I learned self-discipline very early. I learned it as a child. So, you know, I think that um, painting the way I do takes a lot of self-discipline. And, uh, yeah. Well, uh, the lyrical line, like and the, the lyrical series line. of notes that um, if yes. you watch it, if yes. you read it, it forms curves as well. Yes. They're not they're not straight jagged lines. Yes. And so yes. this idea that the, 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 the world isn't straight, it's yeah. all curves, right? Yeah. yeah. And phrasing yeah. is um, yeah. And your I mean your paintings have a lot of curves in them. Yeah. <laughs> Which a lot are, of phrases. <laughs> exactly. And and they intersect. The melodies intersect kind of an operatic sort of way, right? Yes. Um, you know, and layered. I think I think um, in all of them, I do use, uh, I rely on some stencil. And uh, I think the stenciled area to me are like the hits. They're like the, the staccato notes. Yeah. Um, because it's the repeated um, hits yeah. of that. So I think there is a musicality to the work. Um, and, 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 and it's rhythm, isn't it? Yeah. Really, the, the, the hits, the notes yeah. are, have uh, uh, you know, tone obviously, and also pitch, yeah. but they, um, uh, yeah, the painting can be lyrical, and your work is extremely lyrical, actually. As I think about it, and we watch it, hopefully, we'll be able to post some of these images yeah. uh, while we're in post production. We'll be looking at the paintings and, and over over yeah. our dialogue here. They're um, they're complex lyrical phrases uh, that are collaged, if you will, yes. or I don't know if that's the right word. Well, it is, it, it is like a collage, but um, all done in paint, yeah. you know, and in layers. Yeah. So often I will, I will work from back to front. So um, the layers will start building, yeah. Um, can you tell us about a series of work for you? going way back, because I, I know you work in series that you'd like to return to, uh, or that um, it, you're, it's on your mind right now. Um, because sometimes we not only look towards the world for inspiration, but we sometimes need to visit our to own revisit. work. To revisit. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything yeah. in particular right now that you're revisiting? There are certain series that remain very important to me. And one was war. It was my first um, second major series. Um, Solitary Women was the first and really was about 
women and domesticity and um, isolation and using the home as the backdrop for all of these um, women. Um, I was really talking about isolation and, and um, then I got consumed with um, war, which actually I was or came to me after watching a series on CBC called War by um, a historian, Gwen Dyer. And uh, that kind of triggered the political side of me, and because uh, quite often my work has political aspects to it. So I'm very proud of War. It was a very small series, but I think it expressed a lot mm. about the generalities of war. Um, and, you know, when I say the hand grenade that appears in a, in a recent painting, you know, there are ties to um, earlier series. And um, another series I'm particularly proud of is the Embodied um, Ideal series, or um, it's called Old Fashioned Meets Art, yes. And again, the political side, but also expressing uh, my particularly female point of view, talking about the fine art world and the fashion world and the similarities between these two worlds. And the audiences that they appeal to are remarkably similar. And again, you know, it's expression of my political right. side. And no, that series, um, there were, I don't know, diptych is the right They're expression? They're all diptychs. They are, yeah. Yes, and one, one panel is taken from a haute couture ad, whether it's fragrance or fur coats, and the other side is um, a snippet of a late 19th century, early 20th century painting that relates mm. uh, to it. So the fur coat ad uh, was a New York fur coat ad, and it's juxtaposed with um, this lonely looking woman uh, sitting at a table in a diner with a tattered fur collared coat that was taken from an Edward Hopper painting. Well, th those are fascinating juxtapositions. Um, and over at the top of both panels is a line of text, and this occurs in all of the works in the series. And it says, um... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Just look up on the, on the screen here, which will appear in post-production, and that's what it says. <laughs> oh, okay. A Conspiracy to Make You Happy. Very good. And the title of mm. the painting is America. Mm. Yes. So, I, not so much that I want to return to things, but I think I carry forward these political ideas, these social commentary ideas into the present work. And so uh, when I look at these works, you know, there's a common thread that runs through all of my work, even though they may look quite different. And I, I feel quite proud that my ideals haven't changed <laughs> in 40 years, right. you know? Right, you're just more you just more of who you are, yeah. uh, and there's more work yeah. to look at, uh, yeah. which is you know one of the benefits of aging, I guess. There are <laughs> a lot of you know things about aging that we don't agree with, but that is beautiful. Yeah. Um, it's starting to rain here, yeah. uh, off and on, and I I don't know if uh, uh, our our audience can hear it or not, but um, it's sultry and hot yeah. here tonight. Does this climate remind you at all of home? Yes, yeah. yes, of home, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you've also shown at the Art Gallery of Northumberland, which is our, our host for this series. Um, That's where I had the fashion art series, right, yeah. and it, it, the title of the show was um, Mining Beauty. So it, it held the fashion art series as well as newer works that um, happened in the early 2000s that related to my biography. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the news work, which I had the privilege of seeing last week, um, 
is, I mean, they're all connected. Your yeah. series are all connected, but this one is taking on, um, as you said, a more intuitive approach, uh, but not purely abstract expressionism right. or anything like no. that. I went to the Mark Rothko room, and um, this was originally for a chapel. And it was such a beautiful, meditative room to be in mm -hmm. with these enormous paintings, very dimly lit mm -hmm. as well. Um, so painters like that, yes, mm -hmm. I, I, I love their work. What I find most interesting about Rothko's work is that while they are extremely minimal and purely visual, Meaning optical, yes. not you know, no figurative elements at all. Um, he very much was interested in establishing an aura or experience that was, uh, you know, considered a considered experience that was for the viewer. Yes. So I I think. That idea is is beautiful um, because it wasn't just about him, yeah. Um, yeah. as opposed to maybe Pollock, yes. who who obviously self destructed, I guess, and and expressed his uh, his mode through his work. I suppose you could say Mark Rothko, who also self destructed, yes, was did. expressing his depressive. Yeah angst and, and his history coming from a war-torn yeah. environment and, and obviously you know, not, not a well-treated patient. He wasn't right. treated for his depression. Um, but for me, the Rothko, especially because they're often considered in series and in rooms, they um, uh, have, in, in my mind, an elevated position in, in the history of art. Um, because they intend to transport the viewer yeah. to a different place. They're portals, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Liminality, yeah. et cetera. Um, Which I think um, is a great achievement. Yeah, if, it is. If one can do that in art, yeah. you're, you're there. And you don't have, it can be done through one mode of expression, like he did, or it could be done through hybrid modes of expression, yeah. like yeah. you do. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, a lofty goal to be able to to communicate, if you will. I mean, it, it, communication is visual communication, right? Um, it's arguable that in Canada, we have limitations to history. Our history is only 100, 200, 500 years old. Obviously, there's an indigenous history as well. I don't want to ignore that. Uh, and of course, times are changing for the better. Um, but. And we're just getting access to that now as, as uh, a cosmopolitan yeah. body. Uh, I, when I was in high school taking art, there was, mm, no, you know, there was nothing, nothing was. Um, other than uh, Impressionism, I think. That was pr yeah. pretty much the thing, um, which is a very limited geographical <laughs> yes. representation. Um, but the world is really opening up, isn't it? It allows people like us who are immigrants from different disparate parts of the world, Southeast Asia, uh, poverty-stricken Greece, I guess, in, in, back in the day. What's happening in Toronto is extremely interesting right now because there, there is a lot of diversity. There is a lot of hopefully collaboration and learning from each other as opposed to just staking out ground, you know. Uh, this land that, that we live on is, uh, has been impacted by war and conflict, we colonization, etc. Do you feel like a, a minority artist or a person from the margins or a person who exists in the center or somewhere in between? Certainly, I see myself as a outsider in terms of the art I produce relative to the rural life because I don't do landscapes. I don't do landscapes. Speaking of landscape. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 
I love looking at landscape, but I've never been a landscape painter in, in the 40 years that I've been practicing. So uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, I find it interesting because I, I, I receive a lot of um, input from where I live uh, because of the physicality of how beautiful it is. Um, and I, I always say that it feeds into my work, but not in a literal way. I guess what I'm painting is an inner reality that you know, the landscape feeds into that mm -hmm. inner reality, but it doesn't get expressed mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, in the work. It's interesting because you are painting a landscape of a different sort. It's an interior landscape yes. that isn't isolated. I mean, it, in a way, it makes perfect sense coming from an urban environment to create interior landscapes. Because if you think about the urban environment, it isn't a place that is considered a landscape, even though it, really, it is, it's an urban landscape, but that we both um, have interior lives and e e external lives. Uh, and I would hope that if you, if you or I, or any landscape artist was operating in, in that mode, you know, it's not going to be a 19th century mode of landscape painting unless you're Kent Monkman and you adapt colonial uh, painting to a, a different context, which is his context. I mean, that's what I think. We can travel. We can time travel, right? And I think you do very much in your work. You travel in time and also uh, geographically. Uh, and, and I find it really inspirational that you are calling from your historical culture there is a sense that you know you don't belong there, and I think we talked about that, and you don't necessarily belong here, somewhere in between. Yes. Um, but I think you have, uh, you, s you know yourself within both those contexts, and you, s you see yourself, uh, this is my view, that, that you are quite comfortable moving back and forth today. Maybe it wasn't always that way. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, that shows in your work a fair bit. Yeah, um, I, I have been very pleased at how this particular series has been received because I had a solo show in London in March and this was the first time that this work, which took me almost two years to create, was the first time that it was shown in public. And people genuinely loved the work. What, what I really strive for is to express beauty. I, I'm at that point of my life where uh, beauty for me is a political statement. And uh, if I can express beauty. Yeah, thank you for that. Beauty in, in this context is truth. Yes. For speaking your truth. My truth. Um, and I, I think at this time in the global um, situation we find ourselves in, we need more. Well, you truly an inspiration. I really admire um, what you've achieved and and how you, uh, you you're able to express an authentic voice, your voice. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. There are a lot of forces that inspire to yes. to make us something that we're not, yes. and, and often those voices are internal as well, yes. not just external. Yes. Uh, so thank yeah. you again. Um, okay. Welcome. That was too been a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one. use this end. Yes. It was a pleasure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think I use the word um, fascinating too often, too. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> I wonder if our voices are heard well, as I grow with the rain. We'll see. Well, you have to tweak it. Because uh, it, it's kind of neat to have It to is. Totally. I love it. I was kind of crossing my fingers for that. Oh my god.